Welcome to the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. Today, we're going to talk a lot about heart rate. We're going to talk about some fueling stuff. It's going to be great. We have Hannah Otto with us. We're excited for you, Hannah, because you got left fill coming up. It's going to be fantastic. And we also have Nate and we have Ivy with us. But first things first, Nate. Good to have you back on the podcast, and we're going to kick it off with a lot of product announcements. We're just going to announce these things. I shouldn't say a lot, but a lot has gone on. Like, the team has done a lot of cool stuff. Uh, can you highlight those? And then we're going to talk about Hannah. Okay, so we've had some improvements around AIP detection. The first one is we're going to monitor you after every workout and prompt you when it's time to have uh, AIP detection run. That way you don't have to, like, search into it into your profile and click the button. And it's going to be a lot more discoverable for a lot of people. Um, the other cool thing that is in specialty now, we're not going to prompt you. So the, the prompt is going to be intelligent because in specialty phase, uh, you know, it's eight weeks and in there, depending on the specialty you're doing, we're either working on time or zone and repeatability where like 40 KTT would be time and zone and uh, like a criterion plan would be repeatability. And as you get further through the progression, you're either longer time and zone or you're doing more intervals so that, you know, like in a crit, you could repeat more and have more matches left at the end. Uh, so what before could happen is that you could run a FTP detection, you two ramp test or something like that and increase your FTP inside of there. And especially if you had a big bump, you could be going, you know, you could be 250 Watts for your 40 K TT. And then suddenly you're at 270, 280, but your intervals, like you may be doing 10 minute intervals instead of 40, 50 minute intervals of threshold power. So now what we're going to do is we're not going to prompt you during specialty phase. If you hit up against the, the high end of it, like you get to a level nine, what we're going to do is just give you a 2% just a uh, static bump in FTP, which is going to drop your levels down, I think, to about a, um, an 8, 7.58, just a little bit, so that you can still keep that really long time and zone, but just be a little bit harder. Because it would be awful, you know, at the end of your spell speed phase to get an actual bump and then think you can hold that new FTP right away because you're not worked into it yet. Uh, the other improvement that we've done is for those who struggle at the bottom of the progression, uh, we made some adjustments so that your if you do struggle down there, you're going to be 38% more likely to pass your next workout. Those are some people who maybe have um, taken time off, had sick, you know, some other issues, and you're at the very bottom. We're going to adjust that for you. Um, another cool thing we'd have is for a calendar is so that's all the, the AFTP stuff that's going to come out probably by the time you hear this, that, that'll be out for everybody. Yeah. Calendar updates are now our outside workouts. We're inc improving like the visibility of them inside the app. And now you'll see them like they'll be just like normal workouts, but they'll be green. So you can see the shape of your outside workouts, which is um, really good because before there was all just text. And now you can actually see the picture, which is really beneficial. And those ones will be green. So you'll see those around through the app. Um, yeah, I, I think that's it. I miss anything, yeah. John? There's some sneaky ones that uh, people will probably notice. Uh, our team's pushing out stuff all the time, uh, which is pretty darn sweet. A lot of sneaky <clears> things. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to personally vouch for the change. I experienced both of the FTP change things within like the space of a short period of time because uh, I was doing well coming in build phase. And then I did, I got a new FTP. And when I got that new FTP, I went into the specialty phase and then I got sick. Uh, or forgive me, just before I got sick, I was still ramping up super high. And I think I passed like a, I did fantastic on like a level nine. And after that, it adjusted my FTP slightly for me. Then I got sick two days later. Thanks to kids. Love my kids. Uh, you know, that's how it goes. <laughs> and then after that, uh, yeah, I got sick and then it was like, Ooh, you just struggle with a really easy workout and it adjusted things back for me. And yeah, I think that's why I had such a good lead into single track six was because of these, uh, almost I call them like bumper features. And it's like when you're bowling with bumpers, so to speak, like we put up bumpers so you don't land in the gutter. It's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. The specialty yeah. thing is really cool to be able to really target what is appropriate for you before the race. And mm -hmm. before too, it, it kind of puts guards around athletes from uh, doing it themselves too, because if you can trust the system, it will just do it intelligently for you and you have to think about it. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. So yeah, go sign up, check it out, trainerroad.com, that we don't have sponsorships on this podcast. That is the sponsor, if you will. So, but with that, Hannah, I want to talk to you about, because, so last year you went into Leadville with a shoulder injury with, as you've stated, no expectations, no specific expectations going into that race. Um, you went out, you executed, had an awesome day, and you ended up winning Leadville. You're going back as the returning champion now. That's an entirely different psychology, right? Like going into this race now, it's like, ooh, I won last year. Um, this season, you've mentioned it, like we've talked on the podcast, you've had a lot of setbacks this season as well, like with a lot of races where you plan to, you know, this is what you were hoping to achieve. And then whether it was crashes and World Cups, we've talked about a lot of stuff, you've had setbacks. So 
how is it different this year it's, compared to last year? I mean, everything's It's like Rocky different. Two. <laughs> yeah, there we go. It's completely Except for, different. I think, <laughs> Hannah, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think John is slightly downplaying how sad girl you were right before that book, like how bad things actually were. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Yeah, going into Leadville last year, it was just, um, I, well, so first of all, I had three weeks of XCO racing. So I had the national championship one week later, a world cup, one week later, a world cup. Um, and at that third (laughs) world cup, I separated my shoulder. I traveled back from Canada. So I had travel. I was at sea level. I had a separated shoulder. And then four days after that, traveled to Leadville, raced Leadville and won. Um, so it was, the antithesis of what you would consider to be good preparation. (laughs) Let me injure myself, go to sea level, travel instead of train. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Which is now, like you said, it's a really unique psychology now because a lot of the time when you do win a race, you kind of, you, I mean, you should, you should write down everything you did. You should remember what you did and you should try and replicate it as closely as possible. (laughs) And so in this preparation for Leadville, I've had to do a lot of thinking because, you know, short of separating a shoulder again, which I would prefer (laughs) not to do, I can't, I can't and shouldn't replicate that. It doesn't make sense. How do you know? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I was wearing green socks that day, so <laughs> exactly. You can really go down a rabbit hole with it. Um, but so for me, looking at that and and realizing, you know, that that was not optimal preparation. So what what is it that I want to replicate? What is it that I feel like made that big difference? And instead of the physical preparation, I've really had to look at the mental preparation because I think that is what um that is what allowed me to race to my greatest potential at Leadville last year was going in with that lack of expectation which allowed me to fully focus on myself which i think is critical at Leadville i think as a professional athlete and as a racer a lot of the time it makes sense you know you need to stay in the lead group you need to do this and that all centered around your competition and where you ultimately want to finish but because I had an injury, because my expectations were so minimal, I was focused solely on executing my own race. And and that's why when I did get to the front of the race, it was like, oh my gosh, now I'm here. Even in the race, it was somewhat of a surprise because I wasn't focused on getting to the front. I was just focused on executing a strategy. And I think that's exactly what I need to do again. When you said that the expectations, I I would, you said no expectations, but I think maybe you had low expectations, right? You're actually like it, I'm not going to do well. So you just decided to do that. Is that true? Or were you just like, I don't know how I'm going to do. Um, I think, I mean, I think as an athlete, if I line up, I always hope for something. And so it's hard to say that, you know, I was just not expecting anything. Um, but at the same time, I, I was, I was very focused on the moment. I think that's the biggest thing is I had expectation of myself in the moment, but I had no expectation of outcome. And so, you know, because of my shoulder, I didn't, I hadn't ridden the mountain bike at all. I didn't know how it would handle going down power line. And so when I started the race, I wasn't thinking about Columbine. I was thinking about Am I going to finish? Am I going to make it down power line? And so to have that mindset of, yeah, <laughs> that's like everybody else. Here's like yeah, one of the, well, I think it's a great, I think it's an excellent lesson for that is to, to break up this course into these chunks that are manageable because I started with that mindset where I made it down power line and I was like, Oh, I finished power line. Let's see if I can make it to Columbine. And then when I did actually get to the front of the race and the mindset shifted of, oh my gosh, I'm having a great day. I am going to finish. And am I going to win? I still had that mindset of, okay, this is what it feels like to be winning Leadville at mile 75. I wonder what it feels like to be winning Leadville at mile 85. And to just take Mm. it in chunks like that, I think was critical to my success. That's one unique thing about Leadville is that it has very distinct chapters, right? Mm -hmm. Like 
And um, that if you take that, instead of thinking of all the chapters ahead in the book, but instead you just are focusing on the chapter that you're in right now, that really, it's huge. Have you, have you all noticed that, Ivy? Like your best races, when you think back in your mind, your best races, every time I've had a good race, it is absolutely marked by me being very extra present, like in the moment. I'm not thinking about before or after. I'm just so very much aware of what's going on in that moment. Yeah. And actually thinking about Hannah's not ideal preparation and Nate talking about duplicating it. One of the biggest crits I won, uh, my bike got lost in transit and I had to borrow somebody else's and put their shoes on that were five sizes too big and just lace them up tight. And I was like, (laughs) well, here you go. And I think because there was like nothing to lose and, you know, I felt like I, um, any plan or strategy that I had, like it didn't really matter because I was just trying to deal with this setback. Um, I was so present and thinking so clearly and caught the race winning break and won from the sprint. And like, um, the more I race now, the more I'm kind of connecting that, uh, the, the least number of distractions, the more things we can control going into the race or the more things that we're sure of apparently whether they're good or bad, As long as we're sure and not second guessing it, the more space I have to think about what's going on in the race and what my strategy should be and how I should react to things, you know, Mm -hmm. at a much lower level, much lower level. I won my first cat three race and I remember there's no expectation or there's no pressure. That was the thing. And I remember people in the parking lot before were telling me like how not to get dropped from the crate. (laughs) And then, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like to watch out for this surge and all that. And, uh, yeah, it was nice because you. I could do anything, right? I just, it didn't really matter. And I didn't have a really strategy to win. I just went how it, uh, I rode how the race turned out. Uh, Hannah, I have a question for you too, though. We talked about the race preparation. I think we talked about this last year, but it sounds like you had, you dug yourself into a deep hole and then like the travel and stuff and the injury actually made you like have super compensation and recover from that. And it just like, you had a, it, like it peaked you. That's my theory. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, I, I've thought a lot about, I think it's a, a reasonable theory, but the issue is, is from the time I separated my shoulder to the time I raced, it was only, it was only six days. And so, yeah, it, it was maybe more rest than you would expect, but it's still such a short period of time, um, that, I, I think it played a role, but I think it wasn't entirely the the role, if that makes sense. Glycogen I think stores, it, though, too. Yeah. For sure. I think yeah. another thing that is really important for people to hear, for everyone lining up for Leadville, is one of the things I think about having no expectations or limited expectations coming into this race is the fact that if you go in expecting something very specific, you're in for a tough ride. Because mm-hmm. in 105 miles... I can almost guarantee you that something will not go to expectation. And the more rigid you are about pushing your agenda, the harder it will get. And by that, I mean, there will be a time when everyone on course from the first person to the last person feels like dog do. Mm-hmm. Expect it. <laughs> yeah. Don't expect to feel your best self the whole way. You will feel crummy at some point. And the more you can accept that, the better. Your tummy will probably hurt at some point. It'll get better. You just can't fixate on these moments that aren't in line with what you hope and what you expect. Because if you fixate, that's how you're going to spiral instead of just, oh, okay, this is how I feel right now. I wonder if I'll feel better in 10 minutes. I think the curiosity aspect is really important in a race like this. Mm. So have you, um, I want to talk equipment, uh, on this one, uh, and hopefully that's okay. We're going to kind of like spill the beans maybe if Mm -hmm. you're okay with doing that, you don't have to reveal all details, but like, what are you planning? You mentioned last year that you had no time on the mountain bike. I assume this year you've had time on the mountain bike and how are you going to set it up for Leadville? What unique things are you going to do? Yeah. Um, I will be on my hardtail this year. I think you can actually, and I was last year as well. I think you can actually go either way on this course. I don't think it's super specific one way or the other. For me, I really like the hardtail on this course because I think the course is one on the climbs. I love my hardtail. It feels super snappy. It just makes me feel 
invincible climbing. Um, so that's the choice for me. I'm also going to run a 32 tooth chain ring, which again, I ran that last year, but I think it's great for people to hear because 32 tooth is pretty small, but I think it really is the best choice. Um, what do you have knock on, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm on Shimano. So 1051. Yeah. 1051. Thank you. Um, so I think, I think it's important for people to hear because on the flats, a lot of people want to run a bigger ring, but I can put it in the 10 and not spin out. I've never had an issue and knock on wood, I've never had to walk on combine or power line. So I think that it's nice for that. Um, I will run a dropper post. I think that's really important for comfort and confidence. And then uh, a unique thing that I've done at Ledva the last two years is it's actually the only race that I run a 2.2 tire. Oh, yeah. So skinnier. Typically, mm-hmm. you run a 2.3.5 or something, right? With, a 2.4. Uh, mm-hmm. Which tire? Okay. Mm-hmm. The Kenda Rush 2.2. Mm-hmm. Are you going to run two- inserts in there? Yeah, good. I will not. Um, it is a little bit risky not to, cause there's, especially on power line, I'll admit like you feel a little bit of those nerves cause there's plenty <laughs> of places you can hit just right or just wrong. Um, but I don't like having the insert. It's, there's just so much climbing and I really want to optimize my feeling on the bike for that. And so I'm not going to run an insert. Yeah. I, yeah. I think you shouldn't consider a 34 in the front unless you're over five Watts per kilo. And then sure. a 36 is six like Keegan. Yeah. Like that's right around there. Uh, he's everyone else 32 a, or 30, a 36 this year. Yeah, I didn't. I, I think I went running. to a, was I a 30 or 28? I you were a 30. Yeah. 30 and 30. I wish I had a 28 actually. And I didn't spin out on the flats either. Uh, and I, I was in trains and stuff and yeah, yeah it was people. I, I don't think people understand like a pipeline, uh, or sorry, power line. So you've, gone all the way out into the courses and out and back. So you've climbed this climb called St. Kevin's. It's hard. Uh, it's steep. It's kind of punchy. That's the first climb. Then you climb up Hagerman pass, which is the backside of power line. And then after that, you do this, like kind of like net up constantly, slowly, like rolling uphill all the way until you get to the base of Columbine and then Columbine, you go up to 12,000 feet. And then after that, you turn around, and you go, you do the whole thing again. So by the time you get to power line, you've climbed so much and it's so hard. And then power line, like uh, it's quite literally th- over 30% in pitches. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's so steep and, mm-hmm. uh, it's steepest at the bottom. But then after that, it kind of cruelly, like uh, your line of sights limited. And then it just keeps punching on you. As soon as you can see, you just see more punches that are really steep. I think, it's I think still it's the hardest climb like- I've done. 8.5% I think is what it averages. And it's like right around an hour ish. So it, it, I mean, yeah. it's, it's a, <laughs> <laughs> or an hour and a half. <laughs> yeah. no, uh, when I, the year I did it, they hadn't graded the road yet. And it, it's Oof. like a crumbly, like uh, decomposed granite. And it was, there's like little ups and downs. And the hard part about power line, you might be able to spin up the whole way, but there's these little like times where you have to really kick it up. And if you're back, tire spins you cannot get back on the bike you're so tired to like get that like push and going i i think i pushed up like halfway and maybe even three quarters but if you look at the race besides the like these three (laughs) would all be in the front like almost everyone else pushes and then the other part is uh if you're not pushing at least the year that i did it there was only like one path you could go someone else is walking and you have to walk too and that's the same thing with columbine uh, mm-hmm. Hannah, did you see any, ever see any pros on Columbine having to push or does everyone ride it? Oh, absolutely. I've seen a lot of pros, um, having to walk it. it. Columbine is tough because, and I think it kind of varies year to year depending on the trail conditions, but it is, it is extremely steep at the top and it's still a fire road, but it's almost like sloped inward and it's crumbly in the middle. And so it's like a your, Jeep trail more than a fire yeah, road at the top, right? So yeah. it's got like. It's got like one path that's really ideal. Maybe in some spots you can kind of get away with another path, but really it's Mm kind of just, it's effectively like a single track. Yeah. And so basically you're at the top of Columbine. It's so steep. You're doing 50 RPMs. You're balancing on this off camber slope on the side of this Jeep trail. (laughs) And if you lose focus for a second, you're just going to slide in to this rock pile and 
probably have to then walk. And so that's a time in the race that I am so incredibly focused because if you lose focus for even a second, um, which is easy to do because people are coming the other direction, you're having to look up, you're having to pay attention to everyone going around, you will be walking. (laughs) This sounds like a horrible, horrible horrible race, right? (laughs) I'm just like at twelve thousand feet. (laughs) I'm just thinking. Also, when do you eat? Like, I don't want to climb for an hour and not like, you know, (laughs) sit down in the shade and you know, I have some candy now and like. (laughs) Well, the thing is, you don't want to stay at the elevation. There's an aid station up there, but everyone says get down as fast as possible because it can really affect you. You Get altitude sickness, and that can mess your race up too. So it's like it's kind of uh, mean of them to put the aid station they should be like massage chairs and like masseuses and be like come on it's like the devil right like come on you should be come on into it it's fine yeah um that's the the hardest part about columbine that people don't understand is the and hannah you don't have this to the degree that the rest of us mortals have when we race column when we race it and we're going up columbine it's not a handful of people coming down it's an absolute ant line going mm-hmm. both directions and people getting out of control coming down and then taking away the line that you're doing coming up. And it's like, uh, that is a nice really, thing really about being towards the front because like <laughs> Keegan can, Keegan can be flying down the opposite direction. But if we make eye contact, I have full confidence in the fact that him and I will not accidentally run into each other. Like I, <laughs> I believe in him to hold his line Yeah, like, <laughs> and same from- thing with all the, all the pros up there. <laughs> From the age grouper experience, which is, you know, most of the people that are listening to this on Columbine, uh, when I was there, I got sub nine, uh, there is, there was just a huge line of people walking and it's like kind of a shale thing. And then you get the, like the, the male pros, like the man Keegan was there, they fly down, like they don't care. Like it's just (laughs) good. And everyone's, so no one's expecting it. So everyone's looking down. I remember my back Mm -hmm. and my triceps hurt so bad. That was the worst pain in the whole race was pushing my bike. I was very skinny. I was like 25 pounds lighter than I am now and trying to push my bike and my muscles giving out. And then you just hear people start screaming like, get pro coming or like, and everyone tries to go to the side. (laughs) And then what happens is some really good bike handler who didn't go very fast, tries to ride up and will yell at the 45 people like, get out of my way. I got to get back. (laughs) We're not, we have nowhere to go. Uh, Or they'll try to come around onto where the pros are coming down. So you have someone coming down at like 35, 40 and someone else going up in a line of like people just trying to survive and pushing it that I have not heard of any like big, huge um, crashes there. But if you're in that race, like pay attention, <laughs> look up and get to the side because it, it, you know, and when you're going down too, watch out. But by the time age groupers go down, it's so there's such a big um uh, train of people coming like every, you know, 10, 15 seconds. But at the beginning, you know, there's Keegan and then you wait like 10 minutes, right? So you forget. And then somebody else comes down. Uh, even the pro woman, when, when you get there, it's, there's still gaps, but they're not as, uh, they're not as big as those first ones. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, a, a couple other questions too. Are you doing anything else unique to your bike for Leadville? A lot of people change stuff for aerodynamic reasons or comfort reasons because it's so long. Like, are you going to have a separate spot to grab like further inboard on your handlebars and are you going to use tape there or something or anything like that? I'm not. Um, last year on the way back on pipeline, I did do the talk with my hands next to the stem, but I didn't change anything for that. I just, it's a pretty comfortable position for me already. I mean, comfortable is relative, right? (laughs) Um, but as long as you've trained it and practiced in that position, I think, I think it's okay. And what about about nutrition? Yeah. Sorry, you got it all, John. I'll just let you take it. Same page. Look at us. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, So I think nutrition is probably the most important part of Leadville. Um, I think I'll go on record saying that because if you're, I mean, all of everything we just talked about, right? Like you're balancing, you're trying to navigate other people, you're walking, you're like, imagine doing all of that. But when you're bonking, it's impossible. And so when I, when I actually At 10,000 feet too. Like yeah, exactly. And hot. Exactly. Yeah. You yeah. just don't work well. I mean, I no. like, like you just kind of, you're nerfed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I think the food, and I say this because I think it's important for people to hear because I recommend it to everybody. At Leadville, I eat out of fear. 
And I think if that fear is motivating, it's a good thing. Um, and so because it's the most miserable experience to be under fueled in conditions like that. So I, um, last year I ate 80 grams of carbs per hour this year. I'm pushing it up to a hundred. Um, nice. so I'm excited about that. I think it'll be even better. Uh, and then also I'm taking more of that in drink mix. So in my bottles, I'm with first endurance and they actually just released a prototype drink mix that has a higher grams of carbs, um, in each bottle. And so I'm really excited to have that as well. I think it's going to make it even better. Like Ivy said, how do you eat out there? It can be really hard at times. So having the ability to consume it in my bottles, I think will make a big difference as well. And no hydration pack, right? Just bottles? No hydration pack. There's enough, uh, there's enough feed zones where I'll plan on having eight bottles throughout the nice. race. Cool. Mm-hmm. And will Clayton, your husband be the only one feeding you? Cause that's another big part of Leadville is like your crew strategy and who's going to be helping you. Yeah, I'll have Clayton there. And then um, my sponsors at Valet also come out and help all their athletes. And so you can make it from one feed zone to the next if you're a single person, but it's a little bit of a mad dash. And so when when it feels like everything's on the line, you don't want to bet everything on that. And so having two crews is definitely a breath of relief out there. John ran. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> as hard as i could yeah yeah and we yeah. just barely made it to you and then i gave you hot martin and then i feel bad oh. so yeah. <laughs> yeah it was not good um uh, with so taking in 100 grams of carbs what are you doing for sodium because this is like um and i assume that that drink mix has sodium within it but being up at elevation like you probably will never feel yourself sweat up at leadville it's just bone dry it'll be windy so, but you sweat a ton and you lose so much because it's so dry up there. Mm-hmm. You yeah. Sold um, the pro- <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like looking at photos of the uh, power line climb and just these like enormous rain ruts and how chaotic it looks. And then John's like, yeah, you'll never sweat. It's horrible. It's like <laughs> the promoters are going to write us and be like, Hey guys, um, no, they love going to want to do this. Race. <laughs> Everybody knows. Uh-huh. There's people the that are hearing you, this and they're signing up. Yeah. They're like even more excited to sign up. The reason so, you do yeah. Leadville is because you want to experience the absolute misery. That's what we're there for, <laughs> right? For sure. Um, if it was easy, it wouldn't be what we wanted. It's, um, it's avoid therapy. That's what it's for. Yeah, yeah exactly right. <laughs> very expensive, very, yeah. very difficult therapy. Yeah. It's a journey. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, the sodium questions are really good one because it's been something that I've been playing with and really trying to educate myself more on. Um, it's also interesting for me. I have a really, I have a very, very high sweat rate where I need to take in a lot of fluid. So that's something I'm extremely conscious of, but considering my sweat rate, I have really low sodium needs, um, like 300 to 400. Uh, yeah. So very low. low. Um, so for me, typically that what is in those drink mixes and uh my gels have sodium as well um is typically enough which is a nice benefit because <laughs> anything you can worry a little less about out there i mean it, it, it's it's an advantage it's nice Hannah, how did you figure uh, out that that was your sodium requirement um i did testing in a lab cool. yeah. how would how would, uh, for people who haven't heard how would we do this john do you remember if yeah, well, there's, or Ivy. There, yeah, there's, um, there's, it's more accessible now, uh, mm-hmm. right, Ivy? Like Gatorade makes a test patch kit and then Cole Patton was on talking about another shoot. I can't remember what system he was talking about, but another one that you can wear a monitor and, um, for like a pretty long duration of time, uh, mm-hmm. and get results on your sweat rate. Although I'm not sure how there was mixed reviews on how, uh, effective the data you were getting from a topical, like a skin patch like that really was. So I'm not sure, um, how they vary brand to brand. Do you know, have you heard anything about that, John? Yeah. Um, so Nate and I have undergone precision hydrations, uh, sodium loss testing where they test your, like, like Hannah pointed out your volume, your sweat volume, and then they call it sweat composition. They may call it something different now, but the sweat composition was talking about the sodium that you actually lost within that. And then the sweat rate was the total volume. Nate had extremely, extremely high sweat rate as I remember. Um, 
you were like 1.5 liters, like 1.25 to 1.5 liters an hour, um, is in terms of what you lost. And then in terms of sodium though, Nate was like a regular sodium loss person. Like it wasn't like extremely high sodium, a little bit higher, I think, but not, yeah, nothing crazy. Yeah, but your volume was nuts. Like like the amount mm-hmm. of fluid that you lost was really high. It's because so, I'm a big person with a lot of uh, surface area, I'm guessing. Right. That's that's my assumption too. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, that's that's how they do it. You know, I was. Th- this is an interesting point. So this summer, or th- a handful of weeks ago, I was riding with Levi Lightheimer, and he was joking around because we were riding with a group, and we had salt stains, and Levi is still incredibly fit. And he was like, look at you boys. He's like, I've never seen a Grand Tour winner with salt stains on him. And... Then we started talking about that. He's like joking around ribbing us, you know, as, as, as friends do when they ride. And, but then we started talking about it and back in the day he was like, yeah, we never really like every once in a while we'd take in like Pedialyte, uh, you know, like the night before races and that sort of thing. And that was it. Um, and, and, and really like in Cytomax back then was also like one that like it was early days, but people, especially average Joe's and stuff they really didn't take in much sodium. And now it's like a focal point for a lot of people. And I do hear more and see more sweat stains. I feel like that's really hard for me to quantify. And I wonder if it's just because our awareness of the fact that like, I need to replenish a lot of sodium. It's that awareness has risen across the board, across cyclists in general, like people really, they focus more on it. There's more products that have more sodium. They're taking it in. Um, and we covered this on a previous week's episode of the podcast, like there, and we asked Andy blow about this from precision hydration about like, okay, so like, just, is there a limit? Can we just take in tons of sodium beforehand? And he said, you'll probably just sweat it out. And we did talk about, there's probably some sort of weird things that happen with your body, like, you know, excessive bloating and, and other things like that. But, um, you know, as long as you're not going extreme, like our guy last week with, uh, Downeyville, their IV and Tobin and I went over, uh, as long as you're not going crazy extreme, you're it's probably nothing to lose by just taking in sodium electrolyte stuff. So. Don't drink salt water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's also, be so, so, I gotta say this. So, uh, in my research for this week's episode, I somehow came across a study that is analyzing the effectiveness of sodium intake or sorry, of salt water, like ingestion in athletes. And I'm like, did they study me when I did a triathlon? Like, and what, like, it's like, this is exactly, so I'm going to read that study and figure out if indeed, you know, maybe I have if an you, advantage when I'm choking and dying in the water. So one, if you really want to get into the nitty gritty of it, it's interesting to consider the fact that your sodium needs could vary along the course of heat adaptation, because one of the adaptations your body makes, um, as you adapt to the heat is that your sweat becomes more dilute. So you have, you sweat more, but you have less sodium loss. And so it's just interesting to know that your body is constantly changing and adapting and therefore your needs will change as well. Yeah. Super interesting. Hannah, I have more questions. Can I join you up? You want to go? <laughs> no, please. Nate. It's great. Yeah. Uh, Good conversation. Carbo loading nutrition before. So are you going to salt load? Like what is the, the, the day before, or like the days before, what are you changing for this? race. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to change the amount, the, um, portion of my diet that is carbohydrates. So it'll, I'm not necessarily going to eat more, um, but more of what I eat will be carbohydrate and it's all going to be pretty simple carbohydrate. I feel really good when I do that. So a lot of white rice, white pastas, really simple things like that. Um, and I think one of the most I guess, interesting things I'm going to be doing is I'll be eliminating fiber, um, not only for the not needing to go to the bathroom element, but it can really help you eliminate some bloating and stuff like that, which is super important for a big climbing race like Leadville. Um, and so like looking at research and stuff, it's, if you can do less than 10 grams of fiber, in a day, that's really optimal for this type of lead in, um, which is really hard when you start looking. Yeah. It's (laughs) like, you think, you know, considering the fact that a lot of the time we're looking for fiber rich foods and that seems hard all of a sudden when you're trying to go under 10 grams, I look at granola. I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is half my fiber for the day. Um, It's hard for you guys, but for like regular (laughs) Americans, it's not hard. Just get McDonald's three times a day. day. (laughs) Zero grams. Yeah. Tendies and fries. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, uh, fluids wise, I'm really, even now I'm starting to try and increase my fluids because at least for me, 
increasing fluids is more of a routine thing um, I'll, cause I'll get in the habit of either not drinking or drinking, like always having that bottle in your hand. And so even now I'm starting to increase my fluids because at altitude, not only for the race, like in a seven hour, eight hour race, you need to, uh, hyperhydrate, but mm-hmm. for altitude even more so because you essentially, Altitude sucks water out of your body. You lose yeah. more water through insensible water loss. So that's not even sweating. That's just the way that the dry air is wringing you dry of what you have. And so increasing beforehand um, for that. And then also for altitude, um, I don't want to say acclimation, but because there's no acclimation the way I'm doing it, but feeling better at altitude, uh, drinking more fluids to increase plasma volume. Um, and, uh, yeah. And then I, I would say when you get there, I'm going to get there 24 hours before. So there's not a ton of time, but for anyone listening who is maybe already up there or going up there early at altitude, Um, different for everyone, but as a general guideline, nutrition, like textbooks and stuff like that, will say three to five liters of fluids a day. That is a ton. Um, so it just goes to show how much you really need up there. I find it like impossible to feel to like stay hydrated when I'm up at that elevation. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's really hard. Like you drink a ton, you drink electrolytes, you do all that and you still, it's really tough. What about, and that's actually one of the reasons that I'm not going up there early is it's not just about gosh it's everything like it's not just about training it's about it's about being able to keep up with my proper sleep proper hydration proper food I find it so challenging at 10,000 feet um the times that I have gone up to 10,000 feet uh like when nationals was at winter park I went up there really early to try and acclimate and I just it was really hard for me to keep up with my fueling needs. And I entered into the race very significantly under fueled. Um, and for a race for any race, that's not a good thing, but for Leadville, that just sounds like, man, the stake in your coffin. And so that's a reason why I go up the day before for Leadville is because I want to go up there. Even if I'm less acclimated, um, I want to be the best version of my body when I get on that start line. Where will you stay before? I'll it's stay not in easy Led- to get to Leadville. Yeah, so I at least uh, that is a nice thing living somewhat close. You know, if there's if you have to fly in, it becomes a lot more complicated because at least for me, I start always playing with the what ifs. Like, what if your bike gets lost? What if it gets damaged? Like, you need to have a little bit of um, cushion in order to make up for those things. But for me, I'm going to drive in. It's a seven hour drive. And so what I'll actually do is on Thursday, I'll leave Salt Lake. I'll drive about, uh, four and a half hours to Grand Junction, which is the same altitude I live at at Salt Lake. And then on Friday, so the day before Leadville, I'll drive two and a half hours up to Leadville and get there less than 24 hours before the start. Yeah. And then on caffeine, what are you going to do, um, for that? considering the fact that like hydration is also so tricky and those two things really play together. Are you changing your typical caffeine usage? That is a great question. And, uh, I'm actually really surprised that you brought it up, but that's the one thing I'm still trying to decide. We're 10 days out and I don't know what my caffeine plan is. Um, and I've been playing with it and trying different things. So I guess I'll throw that question back to all of you and see if I can get any input here. What, what would you all do for caffeine? Ooh. Uh, can I have your weight in kilograms? Uh, Is that okay or not? Like, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I'm, um, I'm 119. So I think we said that's 54 kilograms. Nate wants to know how much caffeine he can give you before killing you. (laughs) Basically. (laughs) Well, so usually, usually like before an XCO, I would take in, First Endurance makes a pre-race um, drink mix, which is 200 milligrams. So that's what I usually do before like a 90 minute race. But given the fact that this is obviously a lot longer and a lot of other things at play, I'm trying to decide, do I take that? Do I take it again in the middle of the race? Do I take small injection injections? And by injections, mm-hmm. I mean like yeah. amounts of caffeine <laughs> in a gel um, throughout. Like there's just a lot of options to play with. 
Yeah. What's it, Nate? What are you thinking? Yeah, I mean, how much, how often do you have caffeine, and like how uh, to- how long do you tolerate it? Um, I tolerate it really well. I would say I'm a five cups of coffee a day mm. kind of gal. Um, do you have and- ADHD? <laughs> no, I no? don't. No. No. Okay. Light roast or dark roast for the five cups? Light roast. Okay. So you can bang it. The yeah. I, <laughs> So if you did three milligrams per kilogram, that's 162, let's say 150. Um, I would maybe do four of those over the course. And I'd probably not even start with it because you're going to be so amped on adrenaline and stuff that I won't even feel it. And... Um, Maybe so uh, 600 that, milligrams over the course of a race. Yeah, that's a lot. Um, it is because the half life is so that's what I've been trying to like. The half life is what five hours and it's a hopefully seven hour race. Um, <laughs> so it, it's I don't know. It, it's in it's an interesting time duration. But yeah. for one, uh, like six milligrams is kind of the upper limit for performance increasing mm-hmm. for just like a race. Right. But they're thinking about races that are like an hour long and stuff like that. So if we're going to you want to probably have it on the second half to reduce the RPE, because you guys have experienced that where you take caffeine and suddenly everything gets easier. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, Mm -hmm. Um, And also the opposite, where if you don't keep taking it, suddenly everything just gets really, really hard too. if you on a long day, you know. Honestly, though, I would take a little bit in the morning or at least have coffee because you don't want to have that. Um, you probably have an addiction as is probably the, it's the most addictive, <laughs> you know, <laughs> most, most people in the world are addicted to caffeine. Biggest drug in the world that people take. And yeah, I would do that and just know that afterwards you're going to feel horrible, but that's okay, right? Like you feel horrible no matter <laughs> exactly. what. Exactly. Uh, yeah. You're not going to no matter what. feel great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel like after Leadville, after any race of this duration and difficulty, I pretty much straight up feel ill. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, you have sort of flu-like symptoms the next day. Yeah, four months. And they're like and they're another like, the another s- score for <laughs> me wanting to do level. Wow, when are you going to do awesome. it, Ivy? <laughs> you want to go? Gonna we can get next you year. in for next week. Like just <laughs> show up. Next week. Awesome. You're going to be like <laughs> Hannah and just win. Like you're just yeah, going to show exactly. up. And be like, ah, oh, I'm going to do this ironically. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's the win. It's like move. a prank. I'm going to do it. Yeah, exactly. That'd be great. But no, I, like, I would try. I would try that, and then maybe what's that first climb? Not St. Kevin's, but maybe St. after St. Kevin's the first one, and then yeah. Sugarloaf. Yeah, yeah, yeah oh. Sugarloaf. Like around yeah. Sugarloaf, yeah. I'd probably take that first one. Uh, yeah, and then you could do the next one, like early enough, like at that aid station before Columbine, so that you really get a big bump on Columbine. Or I might even do that. You know, if you did the the, the three milligrams, so I'm, I'm thinking about three to six. So if you did one fifty mm-hmm. then, and then about aid station if you tolerate it well. I would do the like this is a lot, but three hundred for Columbine, and then another one fifty probably before Powerline, and then yeah. emergency one fifty. I mean, then you're getting really high, but this is a long race. Uh, what's your time estimate? My time seven like seven s- hours, seven hours. Yeah, last year I did <laughs> seven twenty four, so I'd like to push towards the seven hour mark. Yeah, so the half life's five hours. I mean, you're gonna get it's gonna be halfway gone, right? Uh, th- mm-hmm. that first one. So I think you're still within, well, within safety limits. Um, but high within, if you don't tolerate it well, you can feel nauseous. You can feel horrible. But how I find when I do a lots of caffeine is if I'm not moving, I feel horrible. But if mm-hmm. I am pushing hard, I'm like cruising steady mellow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I guess the main thing that I would say is whatever your habituated rate is for intake on the bike, that's an important thing to respect because it, it can affect digestion and everything mm-hmm. is affecting because of the elevation and stuff. Like everything is affecting your digestion weird. Mm-hmm. So I would like, if you are going to increase, I would like bridge a gap from where you are to that. Yeah. But if I can share like my strategy for people that are more caffeine sensitive that don't habitually take in caffeine, um, especially for a day as long as Leadville is I would, I would not take caffeine until I got down from Columbine. Um, and the, at least for me, this is for me. So, and maybe it can help people that don't take it in often. John, when can, I would, you, can you talk about your caffeine use and stuff? I don't think everyone knows. Yeah. Like, like I don't, I, I don't drink coffee. I don't do anything like that. I'm a member of the church of Jesus Christ, of Latter-day Saints. And that's one of the things we don't, don't do is coffee. Um, it's not caffeine strictly, but because I don't take in coffee or coffee, I just hardly ever, I mean, I get caffeine, trace amounts of caffeine through chocolate, right? Uh, when I have chocolate, but really that's it. The only other I mean, time I do it is rum gum. 
Sorry, you, yeah, you're not like just popping in a run gum when you're like going to the grocery store or something. <laughs> yeah, probably, yeah, yeah, like juicy fruit, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but so I use, and what I found is that when I take in caffeine through gels, oh, it like it it it, it takes a while to hit, and when it hits, holy cow, I'm like I'm a mess. And if I'm racing, like you mentioned, Nate, it's like I'm just hyper focused, and it's like I feel really strong, but the drop off. And then how it messes up my gut and the rest of the digestion that I'm taking in, if I'm taking in like a hundred to 120 grams of carbs an hour, isn't worth that temporary peak that I have. So I've mentioned this before, run gum helps me better. I'm sure there's other brands that do caffeinated gum. It's not sponsored by them or anything like that, but that stuff I just get off of like the Amazon or the feed or anything else. You can get it like really easily. Um, and I take that and I only take the light ones like the 50 milligrams, I think. And then they have like a hundred milligram things of gum that you can do. That's like the extra strength. But for me, I would, once I get down from Leadville or from Columbine, I would take one and I would probably take it on the descent. And then that way I would get to the bottom of power line and I would take in another, and then that would be it. And so like only a hundred milligrams for a person like me, the interesting thing is Sarah did a, did a lot of research into habituated effects of caffeine. And if people that are habituated to caffeine and take in certain amounts and see if they could like measure different responses within their bodies and it actually had less response, like measurable response in terms of like, you know, you'd think that a person that takes in a ton of caffeine, then only has a little bit would be like, Oh, I can hardly feel anything. But chemically speaking, what was going on in their bodies? And you can check out on Instagram. You can see where Sarah posted that video there wasn't a whole lot of difference going on in the body. It was like measurably, it was effectively the same. But then if you talk to them in terms of like RPE, and I don't think RPE, but just perception, because I don't think they were cycling. But when you talk about perception, they would say like, yeah, I don't feel as much from it. But boy, a little bit can go a long way and a little bit or a little too much can ruin a race for me. So I have to be like, um, I ran out of the normal strength ones at single track six. So I broke the extra strength ones into 50 into like in half. So then hopefully it was 50 because I knew that if I took in a hundred, it could derail my day. So it really does yeah. vary quite a lot. So John's talking about like John's a special case. I think for most people, if you go to Starbucks and you get a venti blonde roast, that is 475 milligrams of caffeine just in one drink that you're drinking. And I think a lot of people probably do that because I, you know, I tell uh, Hannah like two, 300 and people are like, Oh my gosh. But people just drink that at Starbucks all the time. And I have a 150 totally. milligram yerba mate here and like 24 ounces of cold brew and Adderall oh just to like get the, <laughs> it's just like, it's what happens when you uh, have to do the podcast. But no, it, um, if you are, Thank a you lot of people don't realize how much caffeine they intake. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, totally. And Hannah, so what, how much would you take? Do you know how much you've taken in previous races or last year? Um, like I said, for like XCO, I take in 200 right before the start. Um, and so typically what I have done for the long races, and I'm saying this knowing that I can improve it a lot probably, is I would take in that same 200 at the start. And then every hour I was taking in a gel that had 50. Okay, cool. Yeah, and have I, you ever taken a caffeine tolerance break for an extended period of time, hoping that when it comes, when you come back to caffeine, that it gives you that, you know, like hyper laser focus? Those are thing worse. John was describing. Those, sorry, yeah, that's worse than Leadville. I'd rather do that. <laughs> <laughs> I have not, and I, um, I, I, it sounds like I need to go listen to this uh, podcast that that mm -hmm. that trainer so road just put out yeah. with the caffeine um because when i have worked and it was a long time ago so research changes i was told that your that it hasn't been shown that that makes a difference it just makes you miserable and that was the answer that i wanted to hear so i stuck with it <laughs> well <laughs> that's that's what we said that's, too. that's the, the okay, research great. shows yep is great. exactly right which Back it doesn't make logical sense you know um but once again science doesn't isn't always logical um, back in the day when I think Mark Allen would popularize it in triathlon and he, before he would win Ironmans, he would say, Oh, I wouldn't do any caffeine for this week or two. And the feeling that you would get that bigger bump and at least you feel like you feel it more, but it looks like performance outcome. It, it is not worth it. So like cyber Super relief, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's like, that's the tricky one, particularly for amateurs. I could see an amateur taking in like, cause it's also really tricky if you are combining what you're t so your caffeine always comes through the form of a gel, 
but you just feel totally empty on energy. So you just te- keep, keep taking in your caffeinated gels. And before you know it, you've taken like 600 milligrams and you haven't even gotten to the bottom of Columbine yet. And you're mm-hmm. just, you know, so it's, it's really hard. Like I, I would particularly for any long day, but definitely for a race like Leadville where the razor's edge is so thin, mm-hmm. I would advocate for separating caffeine intake from the rest of whatever you're doing. Mm-hmm. So, and uh, whether that's through like caffeine pills or anything else, just so then that way you can control it and you don't find yourself in a spot where it's like, oh, yikes, I've completely overdone it and I'm going to die. You know, you turn mm-hmm. to like a 4th of July fireworks show where it all just goes off at once instead of, <laughs> you, <laughs> you know. know. A big difference too, though, is Hannah's like, she's a pro, right? And she's so good. racing for the win. And <laughs> uh, it's very interesting. And race day is always different, right? Because in training, banging all that caffeine, it just, you, you feel awful no matter what. I want... This is me, my personality, right? As I wonder, <laughs> she's she's uh, upping her carbs, and I wonder where that limit of caffeine is. Because we have some research, right, that you get performance up to six uh, milligrams per yeah. kilogram leading in, which she's never tried. Uh, I wonder if in daily, though, with your five cups of coffee, you probably I, – I wonder if you take less caffeine in on race day than you do just Wild. normally sitting yeah, at the desk. Right? It is and possible, yeah. If I would like to, like, kind of – if you'd send me that, I would, I would, uh, or you do it right now. I'll do it during the podcast and try to figure out what that is. Because wouldn't it be a shame if you do less caffeine than, than normal on right. just sitting at your desk? Um, yeah. because we're afraid of that upper limit for like stories like John, but maybe you and me, Hannah, we're like super human, you know, we can, we can take a lot of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a really interesting thought. Yeah. Huh. It's a, it, well, I mean, there's no day like race day, Hannah. So whatever you do, just try it first on Leadville yeah. Day. I'm sure. Well, that, I think that, I think it's funny. Well, it's she's funny that you champ. say that. Like, she knows what she's doing, man. Yeah. It's yeah. funny that you say that though, because like we're going through all these different things. Like we can talk in depth about the training I've done, the equipment, sodium, nutrition. Like I've got it dialed in. Like I've already started packing. Like I'm mm-hmm. so ready. But then you ask me about caffeine and I'm like, ah. So one thing I haven't, and one of the reasons for that is it is so, or it can be so hard to practice. And also with hard in parentheses, I want to put scary, um, because like Nate is pointing out, like maybe it actually isn't that big of a deal because of how much caffeine I'm used to taking in. But all of a sudden, if I go on the bike for a training ride and I attempt to push up on my upper limits, I'm really nervous because I'm not just thinking about, okay, like maybe I'd much rather mess up that workout than mess up the race, of course. But I'm also thinking about, was this going to mess up my sleep? And then it's also going to mess up my next training day. And, Mm -hmm. and it kind of bleeds out. And so it, it, caffeine can be a somewhat nerve wracking thing to play around with. Mm -hmm. And also you like, you can go much deeper. So just that alone can mess up other training days. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it does mess up your sleep. Like the taking that much caffeine, you're going to, like it, it's going to be in your system when you sleep. And, you know, they, the rule of thumbs, like nothing after 12, but really probably 10 is better. And Hannah's going to be doing it much later than that. Mm-hmm. I think caffeine has because a of video race coming out on that yeah. Nate, where yeah. they tested people on taking it at different times of the day. Um, and so it's super interesting. I'm not going to spoil it. The one thing I will oh, say geez. is they have people take in 400 milligrams of caffeine right before they went to bed. Like, getting in their jammies, taking, that was part of the study. Those poor people, like, <laughs> you know, like uh, I, yeah, <laughs> there's zero I, sleep. <laughs> I have but taken I, caffeinated naps before. I would recommend mm. it. It's kind of nice actually. What, what takes, do you mean? What was this? So like caffeine takes, some, takes, you know, like 30 to 60 minutes to kick in. So if you're taking a 30 to 60 minute nap, I'll drink an espresso, go get in bed, take my nap and wake up feeling like a million bucks. There we go. Yeah. The, uh, I think caffeine, though, is to Hannah's point, is one of those things, especially on the long days, you have to experiment on race day because Hannah's not going to le- replicate Leadville yeah. kind of thing. And um, like you said, the, that amount of caffeine, even if she nailed it perfectly for performance, it is going to impact the whole probably week of training and probably yeah. set her back. But on race day is race day. And uh, I'm really interested about the what brand coffee do you drink in the morning? Is it like a K-cup or is it what, what is it? Oh my gosh, I don't want yeah. to tell you. It's so embarrassing. <laughs> you I can type it. Frappuccinos. Five it. Yeah. frappuccinos a day. No, no, no. I drink I drink black coffee. Let's be very clear about that. I don't put anything on coffee, black coffee. Um, but There's no embarrassment just, for a drink. 
<laughs> no, no, no. no That's not embarrassing. The embarrassing is that we're we're not we're not fancy over here. We drink uh, Dunkin' Donuts. That's great. Yeah. Ground coffee. <laughs> I don't yeah. mean going. I mean buying it at the store and making it at home, not going through the drive thru every day. Just to be clear. <laughs> Nate's running numbers. While he's running numbers, I want to go through something really quick because I. So you have some of your race strategy written out here. I don't want to go over your race strategy. I want to keep it close to the vest. Uh, I will because I want you. I, I people should watch this unfold. Um, but last year, your time was the sixth fastest female time in history. Is that correct? Yes. So, if you and this year you're coming in with a better preparation than last year, mm-hmm. I think it's quite easy to say that mm-hmm. your shoulder is in one piece, so <laughs> and it's connected to itself. Uh, so, if you can beat that, that puts you in a spot where you are going to be at the front. I feel like, um, you know, just judging on odds, historically looking at that. Yeah. I mean that, that pretty much sums up my mindset going into the race because I mean, it's so competitive. If you start going down the rabbit hole of each individual that could have a great day, it's, it's a lot like everyone there is so talented and so strong and it seems like putting in everything into this competition. And so if I start comparing myself to others, it's really nerve wracking because I don't know what, where they are, where they are at, um, and what their goals are. But what I keep going back on is while you could have a lot of pressure to try and defend, I'm removing that and instead trying to replace it with confidence in that, I know what it's like to win this race. And I know that on my best day, on a perfect day, on a good day, I have what it takes to win. And I know that that's a really special emotion because there are plenty of races that I've done that I haven't won yet. And when I line up for those races, sometimes I'm racking my brain thinking, am I missing something? Am I missing something about this course? Like, I just wish I knew the winning, what it takes to win this course. But for Leadville, I do know that. So whether or not it happens, we'll see. There's no knowing. Like I said, there's a million people who are strong there. But I know what it feels like to win. I know what a winning strategy can be there. And I know that based on my time, if I can replicate, I have a really good shot at doing it again. I'm thinking of this. Uh, I'm, I'm just super excited for this. If you're racing Leadville, you will get to see Hannah on course. Everybody will at some point. <laughs> so whether you get passed by Hannah uh, in the beginning or you'll see Hannah coming the other way because it's an out and back. So when you see Hannah, like super loud cheers, everybody that's going to be, cause I know that tons of you that are racing that race are listening to this right now. So like super loud cheers, gas her up. Um, and she's going through and can you hear Please, It actually makes a really big difference. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear them like both ways when there's like, go Hannah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's its own caffeine boost, right? Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's awesome. Um, do you, is there a time that you ever don't want like fans to come up and talk to you? Like maybe right before race, just say good luck or something. Or is there a time that you're, you, you know what I mean? Or do you just you love it all the time? by podcast fans, Hannah. What, 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 <laughs> yeah. like, that for you for like, yeah. No, no but it's, I think it's a it's, benefit, right? To be, yeah. Yeah. I think it's great, especially a race like Leadville, you know, like, on a World Cup start line, if someone comes up to me and tries to talk, I might be pretty laser focused and not really take it in because you do have to be so like in the moment there. But I think like we just talked about at Leadville being as calm as possible. There's nothing I'm going to do in the first 30 seconds of the race at Leadville that's going to allow me to win the race. So, I mean, I think you can pretty much talk all the way up until they say go and people are still talking on the roll out there. So um, if you come up and talk to me, fantastic. I'd love to talk to you. Uh, let's keep it positive, though. Huh? Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> Not like, oh, it's so yeah. scary, but this is going to be awesome. <laughs> yeah. The, the yeah. Th- to what uh, I felt guilty about in the past when someone would talk to me, even a friend or mostly podcast listeners, is I'd be getting ready and I'm always like late and frantic and I can't be completely present. I'm like, yeah, I'm like trying to pump up. Um, I, I want to hear them, but I'm going to miss the race if I don't do it. And they're always like kitted up, right? And just sitting there talking to me. Yeah. <laughs> my bike's still in my car. Um, <laughs> exactly. So just be aware of that. Hannah might be doing something and not be able to be completely present, but she loves the, you can do both at the same time, you're saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 You're not annoying her. Uh, 
John, you want to say something? And I have the results of the caffeine. They are shocking. Good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> final, final call, please. Everybody start that race safe. Um, like mm-hmm. uh, oh, uh, level as a neutral rollout that goes downhill. It's you, sketchy. Don't go fast. Just chill. Don't try to pass anybody. It is such a long day. I promise you, you'll end up where you need to be and where you belong. Yeah. Like it's okay. Yeah. Like don't uh, everybody, if everybody listened to this, maybe makes this imp- this effort to make it safe and chill and not crazy will probably save multiple people's days. Cause it happens. Like people have trained for years. Like we've talked to so many people that on like successful athletes podcasts and everything else that dedicate years of their life to training for this. And then uh, quite a few people crash out in that start because there's somebody that's trying to make a sketchy move to get around somebody or they're panicking and trying to get ahead because you feel like the race started to have a lot of nerves, a lot of anticipation, and you're not going as hard as you can right now. So I can move up. It's not the time to do it. Just no be- one's going as hard as they can. Yeah. Be safe, everybody. And then you'll have an yeah. awesome day. I promise. Like, just just be safe. Don't- yeah. I just want to add to that. I think it's – I cannot emphasize that enough. Like, I it just – it's so unnecessary. And I do – remember that last year, everyone going so hard. And the second it turns uphill, it's all going to sort itself out anyways. (laughs) So whatever advantage you get in that time doesn't make a difference. Last year, going into the first climb, I was the 15th woman. Um, and by the time we summoned it, I was third. So it's, it's, it's going to work itself out very simply. There's no reason to make sketchy passes. Like there's some bridges and cattle guards and stuff. And I remember people getting pushed over the edge just don't it's just not yeah. it's just not that important um yeah. those first 10 15 minutes and one last cue don't pass the pros if you see the pros just don't get ahead of them like there's <laughs> there's no point like like they're, they're there and it's you. their job right and they're gonna beat you so like just don't pass them if you see them sit behind them like poor sarah Sturm. when i did it she was with me and she's like a pro trying to race and she's so small that like all these big guys are like, oh, that's a spot I can fill. And, you know, and they were just like moving right into her space constantly. So just don't pass the pros. If you see the pros sit behind them, let them, let them race and let them do their job. So yeah, that's my, those are my It's called being a pass hole. And yeah, yeah. what happens <laughs> like, is on, don't be that. uh, <laughs> well, so I was in the purple corral. I think that's behind red. And a lot of you listening, I'm sure you're in a corral that is way slower than you should be in. And when you get to St. Kevin's at the back, it is completely covered. But there are some people who have started back too far and they feel they need to catch a group up ahead and they will, uh, you know, like go off the trail. They'll kind of shoulder people they go off the trail and then it kind of gets pinched and they'll push people over. Yell um, people to go faster when it's like a endless yeah, come traffic on, jam come ahead on. of them. Yeah, because <laughs> like- the, the, most people are really holding back on purpose on that. So if someone's going like, you know, if they're 4.5 watts per kilo and they're, they're climbing at three, you might be trying to climb at five, uh, because you think you got to be in this other place. One, that's going to be horrible for your race. Uh, there are so many groups that you're going to be able to catch it in the future, but you can knock people off. You can walk. And that's really hard also to start the St. Clemens again, because it is so like swarm with people Mm -hmm. just it's don't be that person. And I think I saw like four people doing that. It's, it's not worth it. And let me give you a pro tip. If you're yelling at people, yeah, (laughs) yeah, if you're yelling at people and telling them to hurry up or move faster, that just tells me if I, if someone does that to me and I hear that, my first thought is you are burning calories. You are never getting back and I'm for sure going to beat you. (laughs) So (laughs) if you open your mouth, you're just exposing yourself that you're way too bent out of shape to Mm. survive this duration of a race. Yes, agreed. Hannah. All right, okay, now that we've got all that out of the way, everyone's going to have a safe and happy race. Nate, go ahead. Uh, Hannah, do you have your mug with you? I want to see how big this thing is, your coffee mug. So that's that's actually pretty big. You know, maybe that's 16 ounce? No, I have no idea. 14 ounce? That looks like a 12 ounce here. 12 okay. ounce is what I'd say, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we can measure later. But the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Dunkin' Donuts brewed coffee... This is from Caffeine Informer. For a 14 ounce, it is 210 milligrams. So if you did five of those a day, that would be 1,500 milligrams of caffeine. (laughs) On race day, if you did 200 milligrams to start, and then you did a gel every hour for six hours, that would be 500 milligrams. 
So half Whoa. the amount of caffeine you would normally take on a day, you do Whoa. take for racing. So Maybe I mean, this I would is an epiphany moment. I wonder how many. I bet a lot of people are in this situation. Yeah, yeah. people don't realize. I mean, I, I look at that stuff again. Measure your cup. Um, I wouldn't jump to like two thousand <laughs> that you yeah. might die. Well, but, and I'm uh, also of course gonna drink coffee in the morning before the start, so that'll like five boost least, it right? a little. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean that it's. It's so good to think through things like that. And I think also like this little group, I think this goes to show talk things through with your friends because people are going to see things from a different angle that you've never considered. Yeah. Lots of so thanks, me, Nate. Lots of caffeine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so wait, that strategy, what I even said was 600 milligrams. That's even mm-hmm. low too. I mean, it's tough. I also, I also feel like when I take it with a pill, it is a different feeling than with coffee mm-hmm. yeah, and I'm not sure why, gel? but Nate, yeah. Or like a it. caffeine pill or gel. Like I like mm-hmm. to take mm-hmm. the pills during the race because then I can really, uh, time it. And like you said, separate it, um, separate it from your intake of other stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It makes sense. Well, cool. <laughs> I wouldn't uh, die I'm today. Excited. I led bill for too much. caffeine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> yeah. Anybody listening to this too, uh, approach it with caution and bridge, with little steps from where you're at, whatever it might be. Uh, yeah, but now I, I'm it, questioning where you're at might be 2,500 milligrams of caffeine a day because of all the coffee you might drink. So <laughs> I'm kind of scared. But anyways, yeah. A, a lethal dose of caffeine is possible uh, around 10 grams. So it'd be 10,000 milligrams. So about 10 times what uh, I've handed 50 cups of coffee. And I've said this before, but I'll say it again. Six. Don't ever buy powdered caffeine. Just scoop it yourself. That's where it happens oh, yeah. where somebody... Um, it's so easy to have that uh, transpose. It makes a, up milligrams a and grams, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yep, and yeah, you scoop it in. The and then you die. It's very hard, though, to take, like, what would it be, like, 50 pills of 100 mil? Like, that's, or not 50. Oh, whatever it is. Um, to take a lot of pills of that, it would be really hard. It would actually yeah. be 100 pills. I can't do math. On, I can't do math on air ever. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Let's get into Mike's question. Uh, and Hannah, I'm stoked It'd for be 100. you. 100 going to be following along. Um, I don't think they have live video coverage or anything, but I'm sure they'll have Instagram story coverage on Lifetime Grand Prix and Leadville's Instagram accounts. That's typically where you find that coverage. One usually picks the men's race coverage and the other takes the women's race coverage. So you can bounce between the two to find which one Hannah is on and then follow along. Um, I'm I'm super stoked for you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm really excited. Go race in the moment again um, and enjoy that. So Okay, Mike says, a huge train of road fan, just did the Tahoe Trail 100 and beat my goal time considerably, coming in at five hours and 11 minutes. That's a speedy time. At nice. that That's, really That's great. Yeah. Way to go, Mike. Yeah. I attribute much of my fitness to always having trainer road to tell me how to spend my training time during the, week, during the work week, especially. Yes. Love to hear that. Uh, you can sign up like Mike and do fast Tahoe Trail 100 times or whatever race you want to do. Trainerroad.com. Uh, Mike says, I want to get to the next level in my fitness, and I'm thinking about investing more directly in approving my aerobic threshold. A paper was released a couple years ago suggesting that HRV metrics, DFA alpha one in particular, and I know that this is all sounding like, you know, alphabet soup. Uh, is a good predictor of aerobic threshold with certain limitations. It's an attractive proposition since all you need is an app and a high quality heart rate monitor, and you'd be set up to continually monitor your aerobic threshold. Unfortunately, I recently saw that one of the authors of the paper wrote something that seems to retract any suggestion to use this metric for aerobic threshold measurement. So y'all know the latest on whether this is a good measurement tool for dialing in the aerobic threshold. Thanks in advance and cheers from Mike. Can I um, first describe what HRV is? I think maybe it's been a while, and I think some people, yeah. yeah. So it's what HRV hard to understand. is? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, it is. Um, so HRV, heart rate variability, it is not how many beats per minute and how often that changes. As that's what I think the what you would think of is like how quickly do I get from like ninety to one hundred and fifty, and then back down, recover. It what it is is it's the time between beats, how often those change. So what you might not. What I never, I didn't know before this is that I thought your heart rate, your heart beat like a metronome. So it's, it's very common, right? Very uh, steady like that. But what happens is that um, when you are very fresh and <clears throat> uh, well recovered, it's actually, it, like it changes a lot and responds to um, things happening in your body uh, in order to better serve you as a human. But when you're tired, it gets into that 
that con- that constant like metronome state again. So what uh, people have theorized is that when you can, when it's you're more fresh when it's it's fast and not when it's not. Um, there are if you read about that, it's like where you measure HRV, um, what your baseline is. There's it's controversial, uh, and there's research. I don't know. We talk about the forum, but there's yeah. there's lots of research around it in different kind of ways. But that is what HRV is. Yeah, there's this constant tug of war going on on your body with the autonomic nervous system between parasympathetic and sympathetic, right? And the concept is, is if you're training really, really, really hard at that point, what you're doing is that's a ton of sympathetic influence. So it's basically there are signals in your body that's like, hey, heart, beat right now because I need oxygen. Beat right now because you need to repair this muscle. Beat right now because you need to do this. So it's really controlled. It's constantly following orders. Whereas it gets to be more free and easy and freelance when it's not so tired. That's the whole concept. And like Nate said, the variance in time between beats, that's your HRV. So when you have a very high degree of variance between those, that's a high HRV. That's typically associated with a person within the context that is really commonly talked about with like freshness and readiness. That's like when they say that you're more ready, it doesn't tightly correlate all the time though. And you can see that in a lot of research. Um, so it's a, it's a bit tricky. The need it's I, like, it's one data point, but there's a lot of other things that need to be taken into account with that. An old 24 hours in old Pueblo. That's when I had my heart, highest HRV after the day after that race, after racing at night. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. All I was up for 24 hours racing is like, you're fresh. You're ready to go. <laughs> yeah. Um, so DFA alpha one, so that basically what they do is they run similar, it's using HRV, the space between beats, right? And it's talking about the variance there. And then what it does is they run some math by this to get this coefficient value. And what they found initially is that, hey, there might be something to a coefficient value of 0.75 that seems like it coincides with the person's aerobic threshold. So instead of using something like heart rate, you or anything else, you could just use this and it could tell you where your aerobic threshold is in real time. That was the theory. And it, it came out with a, with a lot of exciting promise, right? Because heart rate monitors, we all have them. That's exciting. And then if you can monitor this in live time, that's also very cool. Let now, me, I, I'll just tell you, like, too, only some heart rate monitors can measure this. But I bought one, like, hooked up some software and was like, this would be great for endurance rides built into Trainer Road. Uh, this was like a couple of years ago. Um, because it would be great to be able to measure that live on the bike and then adjust your power based on this number and that was like oh this could be the new thing um mm-hmm. but again it was brand new uh you know this john's going to talk about it this is the yeah. cool thing about science with this with this researcher d- did but go, go ahead john yeah so and here's the thing so this whole premise is that if this coefficient value is at 0.75 and that's roughly where your aerobic threshold is that then they could see if you are above or below that 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 would define things What they found, though, is that this 0.75 thing, number one, uh, it wasn't consistent in the data. And actually, there's some research and there's there's a great paper that we'll link to. um, That's just like it's not a research paper, but it's just a written out blog post by Marco Altini. And he goes through this and he says, like, um, this is something I was a huge proponent of after experimentation with myself and after seeing more studies coming out on it. I can't recommend it. And he was actually looking at some studies where um, there were some, and this is always really tricky. Nate, you're good at stats and that sort of thing. Um, better than me, certainly. Um, when you have data where like everyone's kind of like in a closely closely grouped, and if you were to plot them on a, on a chart, they would be closely grouped. But then there's two outliers that stand really far apart. Those outliers can really change the slope of the line that you're looking at when you're looking at something being plotted. Even though there's tons in the center, those two can kind of drag things out. And what Altini found in this one in particular, the one that I'm mentioning here, but there are others that have also pointed out that 0.75 doesn't correlate, is that if you take away those outliers, there isn't a tight correlation to 0.75. And that's where, and this is where, if it doesn't tightly correlate to 0.75, then it's tricky to argue that this is any more specific or beneficial than any other measure that we have to figure out aerobic threshold. But then perhaps the most tricky part, Nate, you alluded to the fact that not a lot of heart rate monitors can measure uh, DFA alpha one particularly when we're talking about doing it not in a lab and then even more particularly when we're talking about doing it in circumstances that could alter heart rate readings very easily like heart rate monitors aren't perfect and it's really tough to actually get something that could measure something like this and outside of a lab environment it doesn't seem that we can get reliable metrics that would then allow us to be able to find something that would be like a pinpoint mark to say yes aerobic threshold has been reached or not 
particularly then when you figure out the fact that 0.75 doesn't tightly correlate for everybody. And the way that Altini points this out is he compares it to kind of like saying 220 minus your age for your, um, for your heart rate. And while that may be generally true across a large population, it is not specifically true. And that's like a very important detail to keep in mind, especially in this case, when we're talking about defining a clear tipping point between this. So this had a lot of promise and it was super exciting, but I mean, like, like I think Ivy, uh, I think it's uh, your notes that you have down on here or perhaps they're, they're Hannah's, but like the fact is that if it's not any more precise than we have right now, and if it's distracting from all that other stuff, then it doesn't help us. Right. And that's, I think the main takeaway that I've got from it. So I looked into new research on this too, and I, I couldn't find anything that was beneficial for this. Um, I'm sure that we could get somebody sharing something to us. Um, but even those papers that Altini referenced, they were like positive and saying like, so this shows that this can be used, but if you look closer at the data, then the data doesn't show it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a, it's a tricky topic for sure. So in the end, I think that this is, this points to like the robustness of using power and the ease of being able to do that. And then especially when you have to like, this is totally a plug for trainer road here because it works. <laughs> it's awesome. But AI FTP detection, when you don't even have to worry about the test, and it's looking at this large body of data for you individually, it is going to come up with a specific point that is beneficial for training and how to anchor your training to it. It's that's the whole point. That's why it's so great and easy. It just takes care of it for you. So yeah, kind of like a, it was seen as possibly a lateral to upward move. And now it's uh, doubt has been brought into the picture to the degree where it isn't seen as useful. So, and this is just amazing that this researcher, uh, like, you know, found something that was amazing, right? Like this is so promising, so exciting. I want it yeah. to work. And then later on looked at more data and said, actually I was wrong. That is like yeah. mad. Res Not everyone does that, right? Like some people, yes. they write their book and like they sell their book and they're making money. And then they, uh, that is their, they beat that. They don't look at other stuff, right? Cause it's tied to their financial, uh, income. Totally. Yeah. And, but this like a, tied to the science, right? Tied to my mm -hmm. ethics of science, which is, I don't know. I respect that so much. It's beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah it's but it's also a bummer because it would have been so freaking cool. <laughs> I know. Right? right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it was, this is something that, like Nate said, we've been thinking about for a long time now and watching um, because it's something that's, we're always trying to like, we're, we're thinking about like what's next and what to bring in mm -hmm. and to do all that stuff. So but we, so what we do want to do is just record HRV for everyone riding all the time and then put it into our ML model to see if it like, uh, it impacts stuff, but then looking at what actual ones we can get HRV from heart rate straps, there's not a lot and not enough at the moment to get enough data to make it beneficial for enough people. But as mm -hmm. you know, as, as I'm hoping that maybe someone from these big companies do it, like, please include it so that we can get that in a, um, as, as technical, but in the regular stream that we would connect someone to and not putting the, the strap in a special mode, uh, to be able to get the data live and, have good battery life and all that sort of thing. That would be really cool because we have a big, you know, think of all the, well, we have like 25 million workouts or 27 or 8 million workouts. Yeah. Imagine that, right? As a scientist and you have that and you have performance outcomes with RPE tied to that with specific um, target versus actual. So see if they actually did it mm -hmm. like, Mwah. That would be so yeah. cool. That's a perfect Dude, ML like behind the tree meme. For mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. <laughs> rather than a, a study with eight people. Right. And then, yeah. Or, you know, yeah. 12, 20 people. Totally. It's, it's hard. So that's, please do that. That'd be really cool for everybody. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Let's move on to or any thoughts on that before we move on. Uh, Ivy or Hannah, any additional thoughts? I mean, I think that the, I think you all covered really well the answer to the question. So I'll just throw in kind of a two cents on the concept of um, this individual talks about wanting to see improvements. And just in general, I would encourage you to understand the difference between measuring something and improving something because those two things are very different. And as a professional athlete who has a lot of data at my fingertips, I'm constantly having to straddle and learn this difference because you can become overwhelmed with data and at some point step back and realize that just because you know something doesn't mean it's making you better. And so everything that you overwhelm your system with knowledge wise, make sure it's actually allowing you to then take a step to improve and not just adding noise to the system. 
Mm-hmm. I was That's thinking about so that true. too, Hannah. Just so like true. The number mm-hmm. of uh, devices we can spend money on as athletes. And um, for someone like me, the thing that will make me faster is just taking care of myself so that I can do workouts consistently. Like that's it. Mm -hmm. Like having this niche piece of data isn't going to be the thing that's going to make me faster ultimately. And it's hard to know and discern when those things and that information and and those tools that are available to us are really going to help us be better athletes or whether it's just cool to know, you know, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's, there's a personality type, which is me that wants to know all that data (laughs) is measure everything (laughs) in my life and then find correlations and stuff. And I know too, we get requests to show you know, support all those things and show all of them. And, uh, mm-hmm. w- what it does is it like, it makes it harder to see what actually matters is Hannah's point. Mm-hmm. And you can get caught up in things trying to chase, um, I'm not going to say any metric as the, cause it'll be, they'll start its own war, but, um, you can get caught up on the stuff, right. That, uh, doesn't matter. And hopefully what, you know, the things that are more complex, we put them in our uh, machine learning model so that we can, you don't have to understand all the nuance. You can just get the the benefit of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I also want to say that, you know, I said 25 million. I, I don't have the numbers right now. More than that for Trina Road app rides. But our database has 214 million, 214 million, 440,620 at the moment. <laughs> it's going up. Um, <laughs> workouts like rides and runs in our system. And that's because when people sync, they, we get their career. And what that allows us to do is get, is really cool, is get data before they use trainer road, when they use trainer road, if they pause ever and they come back and we can get this really big, uh, um, data map because what, what can happen is if we just had trainer road rides, well, then the data would be like fit too perfectly to us. But the fact that we get it before they ever use trainer road and sometimes after, and then with the pause and during in a mix, um, that is the kind of the magic. You get the complete picture. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think all of, um, all of that noise is, I want to loop it back around to power. That's why I think there's so many cool metrics, really cool metrics out there that can definitely help you. But at the end of the day, I think power is king because power is one of the only metrics in cycling that directly correlates to speed or to ability. So power is the only thing really that you can look at and say, if I achieve this, then I can do this, like A equals B um, in terms of getting across the finish line or winning your race or achieving your goal. You know, heart rate, for example, can help you learn where you're at within that power. But I've heard a lot of people say things like, yeah, my power was the highest it's ever been, but my heart rate was really low. It's an interesting data point, but I don't really care because (laughs) we achieved a goal. We achieved what we wanted, which was improvement and whatever those other data points say are just supposed to help you achieve that improvement rather than, um, be a metric in which you're watching. So yay for power. Yeah. Amen. And, and back to what Ivy said on this really quick, you know, Ivy said, taking care of yourself so you can get faster is like the best thing you can do. You want to raise your aerobic threshold. If you can do more training that will happen but also if you can get more from your training. So as wild as this sounds, maybe the best thing for you to do to raise your aerobic threshold is to sleep for an extra 30 to 60 minutes a night is to, you know, put more focus in terms of what you're eating and making sure that you aren't going to, you know, going to bed too deprived, or you're going into your workouts with better fuel or you're fueling during, um, that sort of stuff. I feel like, because your life probably caps you. Like for most of us listening to this, we have life constraints that we can only actually train and absorb a certain amount of hours. Um, most of us like to take on too many hours and convince ourselves that we can absorb all of that. But that's why there's pro athletes that are so special. They can do that sort of stuff. And for the rest of us, we just can't. So yeah, maybe raising your aerobic threshold just looks like doing the other things that take care of yourself that allow consistency, just like Ivy said, a uh, uh, super practical Ivy. And I think that's a really good point mm-hmm. to have. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. I very uh, strategically said, take care of yourself and ride consistently and not just train more or train better, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I am going to be slightly controversial. You can cut this John, but do you know, oh, is Keegan's okay. left, right power always 50, 50? No, it's not. It's close. Does I, I he don't care. Need, I, I won't divulge it. Um, I happen. Yeah, but no, he does not care. But Not at all. that's one of those ones that I think some people concentrate on. How do I get it to be 50, 50 mm-hmm. when that doesn't out and make the, uh, the, the highest power put. I remember I talked to, um, someone higher up at SRAM and they were talking about 50, 50 power and how, what, 
their research or whoever they talk to, and I'm sorry if I get this wrong, but you might be like 4850, but when they find out is that a higher power, you're actually like kind of leaving that leg in reserve and actually kicks in more and you, you do more power and then it's like 50, 50, or it's like 52, uh, 48, the other way. And it doesn't, um, correlate to worse performance at all. You get the same performance because of that shift. Uh, so kind of chasing it, it can make your brain go crazy, right? I want to be 50, 50, 50, 50. And what did I do here? Uh, and there's so many power meters now with like, you can, it's inexpensive to get on both sides. So if you did get that shift, maybe at a higher wattage, it'd be different. Um, but that's, that's yeah. a good example. I think of yeah. the only one I think would be maybe if you're coming back from injury, that would be a very good metric to use. And you can still use that on your head unit. We, we don't display it. You can put that up, uh, yeah. if you're like, and I, but I still, it's more just interesting rather than like, am I going to really change? Like if my leg is, I broke one leg and I come back, am I going to really pedal differently? No, I'm just going to work into it slowly and maybe notice it tick up as I, as I get stronger, but not really. I don't know what I would do. I can't think of single leg drills, but that's not going to really, it's going to show a hundred and zero when I do those. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Can I, I, this is going to feel promotional, but it was just, I, I nerded out on it and I thought it was cool. You're talking about single leg power meters. Maybe think of four eyes. I don't know if you saw this, Nate, but they just released a power meter that has a built in Apple air tag. So oh, like yeah. the, I know about this, that's yeah. so brilliant. Like that is so mm -hmm. smart. I think that's super clever. And I know that it wasn't just like them flipping a switch or something. It was actually, I talked to them about it. Um, is like a whole lot involvement, but that's cool. I want all of like, I want redundancy with air tags across my bike and all of the electronically aware stuff. That's cause mm -hmm. I have, I have air tags hidden in places on my bikes. <laughs> so then that way, you know, if they're ever taken, I can track them. Right. Or when I fly with them, I can track them. And, uh, this is just super cool. I really love that idea more of that. So but it's cool. the cool part too, is it, it doesn't look like an air tag. The, the code, the chip is built into the power meter. So for a thief, you wouldn't know that it's yeah. there. Like who's going to recognize the power meter? Like a, right. You're looking for an air tag. I can't like the first thief is going to be so surprised, right. Yeah. When the cops show up and it's there. Although this other cop once told me that <clears throat> like, Oh no, never mind. They can still get a warrant. But he just said it was annoying to like, you could see that somebody's like purse was in somebody's house with an air tag, but that's not enough probable ca cause for them to go in. They have to get a warrant on that. Oh. Um, and that was just, a, you know, a big pain. And he was, it sounded like he was almost like, I don't know, but it just catch him. Outside you can still get it back. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's go into Johnny's question. This is a fast one. First love the single track six coverage. Thanks, Johnny. Glad you enjoyed it. And congratulations on your results. As you described your nutrition, you mentioned that you had mix in your hydration pack. Others have also mentioned having either electrolytes or carb mix in their hydration packs. How do you clean those packs so that you get any residue out in my bottles. I have some that are water only and some that I use for mix because I feel like the taste of mix truly never leaves. So in my hydration pack, I usually just have water because I'm scared to put mix in it and never get that taste totally out. Uh, what's your secret? What do you do, Hannah and Ivy for, for this? Well, I <laughs> wasn't a hydration pack gal until I was going to be for single track six. So I only did a couple rides with it uh, by the time it arrived to get used to it. And then I got hurt and didn't go. So no, I don't know. <laughs> I never put mix in there. <laughs> How about you, Hannah? Um, yeah, I keep it pretty simple. I mean, you wash it by hand and I think a key is hot water, um, not boiling water, but hot water, cold water. It, I, I agree. It kind of keeps the taste in there. And then, um, you can use like you know, like a little bit of dish soap or something like that. But I think lemon juice also really helps because it, um, if there's any leftover taste, the lemon juice kind of takes over and then it just tastes like lemon water rather than yeah. mix water. <laughs> yeah. If you go with bottles, uh, there are bottles like the purest bottles have like a, a flexible glass coating that stops your bottles from taking on whatever flavor. And it's really nice. I, that's, I, I like that a lot about those bottles. Uh, I think honestly, the biggest key, Johnny, is as soon as you are done, your first task that you do is you wash out your pack. That's the biggest thing that you can do to stop the taste from staying in there. So I just use extremely hot water, not boiling, but very hot water. And I flush it multiple times. Uh, when I got done with single track six, I would finish the stage. I would ride back to the van. And when I got back to the van, first thing I do is I would, I would get water hot in the kettle. And then I would let that, once that cooled off a bit, I would pour that into my hydration plaque and I would pack and I would flush it multiple times. And then at that point, uh, that's what I would do. So 
I found that with dish soap sometimes, like you just can't get that taste out, like Hannah said, and then it's preferable mm -hmm. to have at least a lemon taste than something else. But that's what I do. So, uh, Ruby's question. John? Oh, sorry, Nate. So I, <laughs> yeah, good point. Yeah, I don't know if you have a strategy for it. Uh, well, mentions having different bottles for both. If they're really sensitive, just buy another one, twenty to forty dollars. Like you guys, yeah. like all the steps that you do and then actually then tasting soap and all that sort of stuff afterwards or lemon, <laughs> I would just get an extra pack like that and mix it up. But I personally just never do water only because why would yeah. I do that? And you have, have you ever had else. Mix clog the hose? Mm -mm. No. Okay. Back in the day, probably with like That's hammer thick. heat. I haven't <laughs> either, but it's an chunky. irrational fear I have. <laughs> just, put pudding, just a jello pudding into it and just sucks yeah. it through. Like the, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, one, one hot or one, one very important tip on that is make sure that you're, it's easy for people to wash out the pack, but not empty the hose. Mm. Uh, so what I do is like when I'm rinsing it, I put in the hot water, I shake it all around. Then after that, I drain it out of the, I drain it for a while out of the actual nozzle. So I'll hold the pack up and drain it. So that way that hot water goes through and cleans that out. Um, it's important detail. So Ruby says, uh, thanks for the podcast. I've started cycling less than a year ago, coming from a CrossFit background, and we're going to need all of us to just guess on this one. Okay. We're going to uh, opine and share our ideas. I don't think there's a sp strict answer on this one. I've noticed that in the hot weather, 30 to 40 degrees Celsius, about 86 to 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Ruby, you're amazing for running the the conversions for us. Uh, 10 <laughs> points. Thank That's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not able to raise my heart rate as high during my training as compared to more moderate temperatures. Same holds for my resting heart rate, which is substantially lower, about 5 to 10 beats per minute, lower at 40 BPM during days with hot temperatures. However, science shows that normally in hot weather, people on average experience higher heart rates, largely because of the body's cooling efforts. I seem to be experiencing the absolute opposite. Is it because my body is unable to handle the heat and therefore protects itself by limiting overall effort? Or is it something or something else going on? And do some people experience lower heart rates and high temperatures for other reasons? Would love if you could take some time to answer my question as Europe is getting hot this summer from Ruby. Uh, I, I'm gonna I, did, I did a lot of research on this one. Whoa. Um, lots of it. Um, uh, but in the I'm, end, all I'm left with is thoughts. So, Nate. I'm going to go the simple answer first. Uh, yeah. It is uncomfortable to go really harder in hot weather. And they are limiting themselves and not going as hard. That's not pushing up as high. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. That was the exact like, answer I had. Yeah. And they're aware of the heat very much so. And they're watching these metrics kind of that we talked about. And if you are, uh, when you're aware of it, you kind of can make it happen. So it's placebo, right? You're like, Oh, I can't go any harder. This is, mm -hmm. uh, I'm so, I'm so bad in hot weather. Oh my gosh. Honest. I'm so bad in hot weather ends up. You're bad in hot weather. Yeah. Okay. We this was, the that was, tell ourselves. Yeah, yeah, that was the exact answer that I had as well Is you just probably aren't pushing as hard in the heat. And so I'd be curious actually to know if your power numbers are as high. Um, but then what I used to back up that theory was the fact that they said that their heart rate, their resting heart rate was lower as well. Um, because it, theoretically, the heat shouldn't really influence your resting heart rate because resting heart rate is a sign of your abil your body's ability to recover from one day to the next. Um, so if you pushed really hard in the heat, you might not recover as well and therefore have a higher resting heart rate, like they said is common. But the fact that yours is lower just tells me that overall you're probably maintaining a lower amount of stress on your body, therefore pushing less hard in those workouts. That's genius. Mm -hmm. Especially if Ruby is a newer <laughs> cyclist, um, there's no way that scale of RPE is really, really fine tuned, especially mm -hmm. if you're not looking at power um, mm -hmm. on a hot day, you know? And yeah. what would normally happen is your heart rate would be jacked, um, your sweat would be high, the RPE would be really high, but the power would be low. Mm -hmm. That happens. We've seen John and I, and like we've <laughs> cycled in our train or bathroom with a shower on at like <laughs> a pettit, like an endurance heart rate, like. Like threshold. well above, like, yeah, threshold way. <laughs> like my heart's like 188, right? But now 220 watts uh, uh -huh. at like a 340 FTP. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that's also the most likely answer for that. Um, if we step back and think about it, your heart is a muscle and it's easy to forget that. But like we know that blood is pumped to our muscles and it's pumped to our muscles and then it can deliver, can remove byproducts, deliver oxygen, right? But blood is also used to cool the body. And the way that it does this is it goes to the skin, right? Um, and the closer it can get to the skin, the more heat it can shed to the outside environment. Um, so 
even though I think that the theory that was put out there first is absolutely, I think the most influential one. I want to go through like some ones that could be possible, but probably not likely. Um, number one, dehydration. And I don't think it's likely because this one can kind of go both ways, but remember that your heart's a muscle. So like dehydration almost always increases your heart rate because your heart has to work harder to pump less fluid, um, around you lose plasma volume as you become dehydrated. And, and that just is what happens. Blood even gets thicker, right? And so thusly your heart has to work harder, um, could cause more fatigue. And that's just it. If your heart is a muscle, uh, theoretically, you know, it could be experiencing more fatigue and could be limited just by the fact that you don't have as much fluid. So it's pumping as hard as it can, but just by the fact that you are, you know, this would probably be pretty extreme levels of dehydration, your heart's capacity, just like your muscles capacity could be limited by that. So that could be affecting it, but I don't think that's likely the main case. The other one is like the thermal regulation side and also decreased oxygen side of things too. I mean, if more blood flow is being sent to the skin to cool it off, and that's more of a focus for things rather than just going directly to the muscles, then perhaps you have less available to help the muscles work harder. Um, all these things are likely increasing just to the fact that like Hannah, you said, you're not pushing hard. You're probably pushing very hard. You're just not working, doing as much work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and your work rates limited. So it could be limited because of those things. But in the end, uh, that's really what we're talking about. Like Nate and I said, when we were with a heater and the shower on, and it was like over a hundred degrees and crazy humid, your body is just distracted. It can't just devote all resources into pushing the muscles and your heart being one of those muscles, the faster it can beat, the more, you know, the more work's being done by it. So it could be capped that way too. Um, but I looked through so much like so many papers trying to find stuff and look through reviews and then look through all the references on like <laughs> reviews. And I tried to find anything and nothing shows that there is decreased heart rate outside of conditions like dehydration outside of conditions like, you know, where people are ill or in other ways, like, you know, chronically fatigued. That's when they, you can see like a depressed heart rate. It just simply can't go higher. Um, but there's nothing that shows heat directly, causing this outside of the, because in most cases, studies are operating at a specific work rate. The studies are like athletes rode at this many Watts. And then this is what happened. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's, I'll I think why there's a lack of evidence for it. I'll throw out one more theory that I don't think is probably it, but it's just something to consider is, um, a lot of the time when it is super duper hot, I'll ride really early. If it's an important ride where I need to hit those numbers mm -hmm. and in the morning, um, like we're talking really early five, 6 AM. Uh, I, my heart rate is 10 beats lower. And again, it's a muscle. Your heart has to warm up as well. And so it is possible that maybe if you're going out and you're trying to beat the heat a little bit, um, I don't know, maybe in the morning it's, it's a not actually the heat. It's the fact that you're riding early and your heart rate is taking a minute to warm up. This is, it's, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's absolutely my experience too. And I wonder how many people misattribute fasted training because they train early in the mornings when they do fasted training. And when they're like, yeah, my heart rate's lower at a certain power. But like when I wake up, I'm 10 beats lower, just like mm -hmm. you 10 to 15 beats lower is like what I see, which is pretty crazy. Um, mm -hmm. but that's just, my body's not ready to work yet. <laughs> Even though I'm making it work, it's like, come yeah. on, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. It doesn't want to do it. Uh, okay. Ryan's question. Thanks for the podcast. It's one of my favorite things to listen to during these indoor training sessions. I have a question regarding my endurance as I can't understand what's going on. My most recent FTP test, and we should clarify, Ryan does not have a trainer road. It doesn't use trainer road to train. Ryan does have a trainer road account. So I assume to just like view data and do that sort of stuff, Ryan, maybe you signed up just so that we could look at your account to do that. I commend you. If so, thank you for making your data available uh, so that I could look into this. But Ryan, when he says FTP test, this is not using trainer road. This is just a test that he took. My most recent FTP test gave me a new PB of 353 Watts. That's big power. Um, which I'm very happy with. And this proved to be an effective number when to base my shorter interval sessions um, for power targets, uh, such as VO2 and things like anaerobic efforts. However, I seem to have a major problem with my endurance that I cannot seem to improve on. When doing longer rides, like two hours plus, it's not uncommon for me to struggle uh, to hold even 200 watts despite this relatively high FTP. I find my heart rate goes through the roof and I seemingly have nothing in my legs to put the power out. 
I'm very confident this is not a fueling issue as this is still the case even when taking in over 100 grams of carbs per hour. Can somebody please help me try to understand what the heck is going on? <laughs> Regards from Ryan. We can try, Ryan, but we might not know everything. Um, like, you know, uh, but based on the information that we have, we can go with that. I want to uh, I, I, go ahead, Ivy, you first. Oh, no, you go. Okay. I want to share one thing. So um, I looked at what Ryan's done in for, for training and everything else. It looks like Ryan doesn't take recovery weeks hardly ever. Um, one big thing, Ryan, uh, a week off the bike can really help. And if you're really fatigued, that sort of thing, you might be able to eke out something. I don't know what sort of FTP test efforts that you use. You might be able to eke out like a really high effort um, and, and get one thing across the line there, but that you might be like chronically fatigued. So taking weeks off uh, can really help, especially when you've gone so long without like something that where there's like a truly significant reduction. Um, but I used, so an admin version, so an unreleased version of AI FTP detection, uh, that I have used across the, these personally, and then across a lot of other athletes with like great success in being able to, to figure that out. Um, I'm, it's only an admin one because since Ryan doesn't have an account, that's what I'm using it as I'm just trying to be clear. Ryan, when he said that he got a 353 FTP, it was, it was suggesting that he would have a 329 FTP. And that's a huge difference, like substantial difference. Um, when we're talking, you know, t over 20 Watts difference at that level, it's pretty darn big. Um, so this is what, uh, this is kind of why we designed AI FTP detection to be like, to take care of, there's some people that are quote over testers where like they can really like really push an effort while there are many people that are under testers, right. Where they just can't. And I've been on both sides of the fence at different times in my cycling, uh, experience where like, sometimes I'm, I can over, uh, perform and underperform. And this is why we did it. So you don't have to worry about that and like base everything off of one effort on one day. So that's one thing that I would say is Ryan, uh, your threshold, it seems like is too high and you can get away with like shorter stuff and be like, yeah, I can do it. But in reality, it's looking like it should be lower than that. The, um, um John would jump in here. So what, what, what's probably happening with Ryan is he has a very high anaerobic work capacity and Pete, uh, old podcast, but he's an example of that too. Um, by the biggest difference I've ever seen someone have that happen <clears throat> where meaning that, uh, his anaerobic energy system is proportionate to his aerobic energy system, much, much, much stronger. So in these VO two max and, um, anaerobic work capacity stuff, he is having a lot more of that system work. And he's not having the impact on his, um, his aerobic system as much. And it's kind of like taking over. And so if it's someone who's VO2 max, especially if he's doing like on offs or something like that, it, he might not really be stressing his VO2 max system as much that paired with maybe, um, training a bunch, having, uh, maybe chronically low glycogen, like where at the longer stuff, he kind of fades off just cause you did hundred grams per hour does not mean you came in fueled. Right. Like mm -hmm. <clears throat> if you didn't come in stocked, you do hundred grams per hour. It's going to go really fast, especially with, uh, even, even at 200 Watts. And that is, and it takes time also, for that to, <clears throat> to like, you know, if he's doing like an hour long workout and he's coming in under fueled, but then he starts taking in hundred grams and he starts the ride, you're going to get that benefit toward the end of the ride, but you're not going to have it for the majority of it. And back in the day, uh, before adaptive training, we would get some flack about having, you know, things based on just FTP and having our VO2 max intervals be a percentage of that. And, uh, you know, we, we built it for a bell curve of people to work. And then we, we knew that and we improved on it. And that's why we have progression levels where, um, if Ryan were to use trainer road, he could have the FTP of, let's say you put him at 329 and maybe his, uh, anaerobic level would be a seven, but his endurance level could be a two. And that what what that would do is um, make sure that his anaerobic was at the right level, but also it would it, it detaches it from FTP, and he would see where his weakness is. He could see that the relationship between those two are lower, and it would train him through there appropriately. Because I mean, I don't know why the 200 watts seems like a a real like something else is going on there, but mm -hmm. um, train him progressively through that system in order to bring up the. Um, his aerobic energy system to be closer to his, like how good he is with anaerobic. So the, the gap isn't that big, but also Ryan just race crits. Like you're going to win. <laughs> this is crazy. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Ivy, what are your thoughts on this? Um, oh yeah. I mean, um, Nate said exactly what I was going to say about this. Ryan probably being an anaerobic rider, um, because I very much am. And I know that when I'm 
kind of over setting my power targets with a higher FTP than what it should be. Um, the way, the place where I feel it is in that endurance zone when my target kind of dips up into tempo, the difference in RPU that that feels like is so much more severe than a little bit Mm -hmm. of a difference at the upper end of those harder intervals when you're that kind of rider. So I do think there are probably some, you know, things like chronic fatigue that are making just riding and endurance feel really tough. But I, I do think that, Ryan's probably a more anaerobic rider and that's what they're experiencing. Mm. Hannah, your thoughts. Yeah. I mean, I, I completely agree with everything that's been said and I feel like I've looked at this and tried to think of all kinds of really, uh, nice things to be able to articulate why he, Um, why Ryan can't hold 200 Watts, but I think the bottom line is you need to improve your endurance and you need to improve your aerobic capacity. I don't think it's anything complicated. Exactly. There's a reason that FTP is measured by aerobic efforts, eight minutes, uh, 20 minutes, ramp tests, 30 minutes, an hour. If we could measure FTP based on a three minute VO2 effort and a percentage of that, we would all do it. It would be so much easier to test. Um, And so it just goes to show that that energy system is very different than the aerobic system. And I think you have some work to do in the aerobic system and that's okay. It just takes time. We all have our different strengths and this look and you have identified your strength. And I think in this question, you identify your weakness and that's fine. So you can go work on it now. Even the 20 minute test it can be impacted by anaerobic work capacity for sure. Um, mm-hmm. oh, but yeah. I mean, it's totally. just, it's like, as Hannah said, it's like a sliding scale. The longer you go, mm-hmm. um, the less impact you'll have, but also then the more impact motivation has, because it's really, really hard to hold 60 minutes of your FTP for an hour. Um, that's up there with Leadville. <laughs> more min- yeah. more minutes of uh, potential th- things to go wrong and interfere, right? Like mm-hmm. that's like a tricky part with it. I-, I think that you're probably a bit of an example of like a self-fulfilling prophecy here, Ryan, where like you do really good at this anaerobic stuff. So you're like, I'm an anaerobic rider and you just train that more often than a normal rider would. And you even probably do it subconsciously. Like when you go out and ride, you probably surge and punch. And rather than hold things steady, um, that's like what I recognize with athletes that have a really high AWC, like Nate mentioned, they tend to use it a lot and they don't rely on what they don't have. So that can really pigeonhole you and put you in a spot where, yeah, you've neglected that. So, um, yeah, just, uh, working on that. So practically what that might look like is, uh, if you don't have any races coming up, Ryan, you could just throw on like a base plan or two and do a lot of base work for a while. You could do one of the polarized base plans that, well, it'll still have you doing those like harder, it'll have you doing threshold workouts instead of those really short VO2 workouts. So that could probably be good for you. And then it'll also have you doing the endurance work. Um, you could do sweet spot base is that will be pushing you away from doing the, um, the higher stuff and it'll have you doing stuff that's going to be closer to where you need to work on. So, um, you don't just have to ride at 200 Watts to improve your ability to ride at 200 Watts. Like we've all talked about, mm-hmm. it's about approving appro- your aerobic capacity and your aerobic fitness, I should say. And by doing that, what we're really talking about is, um, there's lots of ways to, to take care of that. So you don't just have to ride at 200 Watts and t- for points of reference at 329 Watts, which is what it said your FTP would be, you know, you're, you're looking at anywhere from like 190 up to 230 mm-hmm. Watts being quote your Z2, mm-hmm. um, not polarized Z2, but seven model or seven zone model Z2. So that's where you'd be looking at. Um, so you'll get there and you'll get to the point where you can hold that as long as you work at it. It's basically that simple. So, uh, I think we should cut it there. This is a long one. Um, but awesome questions. Everyone that submitted them, you can do it at trainerroadcom slash podcast. It's great that you do that. You can sign up for train road. Like Hannah said, uh, testing is hard. Just use AI FTP detection and said, you never have to test. It's so darn cool. It's giving me way, 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 way better training. And all the athletes that I talk to, they love it. So give it a shot, uh, go sign up and go follow Hannah and cheer for Hannah. Uh, if you're going to be at Leadville, have a great race at Leadville and support her along the way. Super exciting. Good luck, Hannah. Thanks so much. Good luck. Yeah. Ivy, when are you going to put your name for the lottery? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, sure, Nate. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll do it if you do it, okay? Nate and I will crew for you. How about that? <laughs> oh, we'll be my there. gosh. <laughs> and I'll have a cooler this time instead of Hot Martin, I promise. So. I mean, let's agree <laughs> yeah. that if that we'll only do it if we both do it. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah, oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. We're not doing it. Like, so I mean, there's no chance I'm doing that. So, no chance I'm doing it. Oh, man. <laughs> I thought that, that would mean that you would like commit to putting your names in the lottery or something at least. Yeah, I did too. No, I, I mean I that's what I'm saying. If we put our <laughs> names in the lottery and we both are uh, oh. get in and Nate does it, I'll do it. Tandem, <laughs> both you guys on the tandem. <laughs> oh I'd be driving. That'd be horrifying for me. <laughs> uh, Just way close too your eyes, Nate. It's fine. Just, Just close, close your eyes. eyes. I'll get it. Can there. you imagine? Don't worry. Like <laughs> I'd be like this, and here's the, this big guy behind, like eyes closed. <laughs> I'm scared. Hands not even on the bars, just covering your head. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Like, no, I, I have my arms around Ivy's waist, like just <laughs> hiding, like a like in the back of a motorcycle for dear life. <laughs> yeah. And it'd be funny too, because like tiny Ivy and then like super tall Nate behind. It's like the total opposite yeah. of what you want to do, you know. But uh, anyways, if you guys think that Ivy and Nate should race Leadville on a tandem, let us know in the comments below. Uh, I don't know if we'll follow all of that. <laughs> advice that we'll get but it'd be pretty funny and i will crew for both of you if you do that so uh thanks everybody for listening we'll talk to you all next week take care good luck hannah bye-bye yeah you got, you got <laughs> good it. luck